Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. I'm glad you could come. So I can speak to the same thing as going on in the middle school for right. sure. Right. Yes. And, and the elementary as well. And so I think that that's one of the points is that we, as a curriculum team, including the literacy specialist for the elementary school and the math coaches, will talk about what are those transferable skills. And those are the skills that are going to help students to handle non-regular problems when they have the ability to take or, or projects when, when they have those that bag of skills that they can just take and, and transfer to a, another subject area and they're used to that. And by asking them to do SpongeBob SquarePants against another text gets the, the idea that two things that look very dissimilar could can have similarities. Yeah, thanks. Great. Uh, Mr. Cochlin, uh, um, please come up. I know we saw you um, about a year ago and so this is um, just a nice uh, update about what's um, been going on in the past year and what your, your, your thoughts are for the coming years. <clears throat> and I know you have some colleagues, so uh, <laughs> please introduce them and speak, I'll speak into the microphone. Yes, so very happy to be here with all of you tonight. Um, and I brought two of my wonderful colleagues with me. Um, Kristen Watchelhausen, who's a sixth grade ancient civilizations teacher, and Tom Bushel, who is also sixth grade ancient civilizations teacher. So they're gonna talk more about some of the exciting things going on in our sixth grade curriculum uh, once we get a little overview of things. Um, but I appreciate you bringing up that it was about a year ago that I was here yeah. because at that point, you know, my eyes were open really wide. I was trying to learn about the students, about the district, about the curriculum, um, learning about the teachers. And it's so crazy to think about how much has happened in the past year, how much I've learned and just the work that we've done and the work that we have going forward. Um, to start off, we have two pieces of very, very good news. Um, first one is that our um, Odyssey National History Day students, we have 10 teams that are moving on to the state competition wow. now. Um, and Tom Bushell is one of the advisors this year, along with Jason Levy, so we're really excited about that. Um, Odyssey is always well represented at states and at nationals, so that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, and then one of our other sixth grade teachers who isn't here tonight, Allison Sansonito, um, has been selected as the Mass Council for Social Studies Middle School Social Studies Teacher of the Year. Um, so we're also very excited about that. Um, so lots of wonderful things to lead off. Um, so it has been a really, really great year um, in multiple different ways. The top is a group of fourth graders at Bishop that I got to spend a lot of time with. They wanted to just ask me questions about the election process, and I sat there for 40 minutes, um, and it was a really, really, really great conversation that we had together. Um, then the bottom is a group of students from the high school. Uh, this year I'm co-teaching a class with um, one of our first year teachers, and we took a field trip to the Ted Kennedy Institute where they all got to be different senators and argue about immigration bills. Um, so I feel like I've been here, there, and everywhere this year, but it's been great. Um, so to go over some things, we'll kind of go over what we've done this past year, and then we'll go over um, looking forward, what we have look, to look forward to. Uh, the biggest district-wide initiative was the election. Um, and this was something that I never thought would be so complicated in all the years that I've been in education so far. Um, one of the things we did this summer is we got a group of teachers together to come up with um, some guidelines for teaching the electives, uh, the election, they researched resources, websites, readings, and we broke it down grade by grade about you know, what are the appropriate things for a first grader to be learning about the election? What are the appropriate things for a second grader to be learning? When do we even want to introduce the ideas that there's two political parties? Mm -hmm. um, so I feel really happy that we put together a really nice guide that the teachers, specifically the K through five teachers, use to teach the election. Um, you know, kindergarten, first grade, we didn't necessarily even talk about Trump and Hillary Clinton. Um, instead, students got to read about two different literary characters and vote for which one they liked better. Uh, so we figured leave the politics out, but let them understand what this process of voting and um, what democracy really looks like in a different piece. Um, so there were lots of mock debates at the high school. Um, students were debating the Massachusetts ballot questions. We had um, mock elections um, from the middle school and the high school to see who our students would choose. Um, and what, be, what could have been a very thorny subject, I really applaud the teachers and administrators in the district for doing a fantastic job of making sure that there could be good conversations, making sure that people felt comfortable regardless of their political beliefs. 
Um, so that's all the teachers that did that amazing work on the election. Um, but that's one of the things that we're really proud of this past year is the work on the election. Uh, so K through five this past year, some new developments. Um, in second grade, we added a new unit. Uh, we added the Tio Sinte and El Salvador unit that was in fourth grade, and we moved that to second grade. Um, so now in second grade, it's wonderful. Students are doing Tio Sinte and El Salvador, and they're also doing our sister city um, in Japan. So it's a nice comparison for the students. Um, students at the end of the year are going to come together and um, do a project that has them compare life in Tio Sinte, life in Japan, and life in Arlington. Um, so we're really excited about the level of synthesis and compare and contrast that second graders are going to be able to do. Um, in third, fourth, and fifth grade, you can see a picture of me, Linda Hansen and Tammy McBride up there, our literacy coaches. Uh, we spent a lot of summer, a lot of the summer with um, elementary school teachers working on integrated English language arts and social studies units, uh, making sure that students can see those clear connections between history and between what they're reading and writing. Uh, so we worked on them for third grade, a unit on the Pilgrims, fourth grade, a unit on immigration, and fifth grade, a unit on the American Revolution. Um, and this summer, we're going to be working on another one um, for first grade, which we're excited about as well. Uh, so teachers are piloting these units this year. We're going to come back together over the summer, see what worked, see what didn't work, and uh, go from there, really. Um, then another great thing that we had is some good PD for the fifth grade. Uh, the organization Children Discovering Justice, we had come in and do a uh, fifth grade PD. Discovering Justice is based out of the Moakley Courthouse. It's all about civics. It's all about having students understand big questions like what is a right, what is fair, what is a law, what is a rule. Um, so they did some work with the fifth grade um, teachers to get them familiar with the curriculum and see if this was a curriculum that we wanted to pursue. So K through five, moving forward, one of the of the projects over the next year is geography benchmarks for each grade K through five. Uh, we want to have a nice level of horizontal alignment across the different schools. So make sure that every second grader by the end of the year is having common experiences and knowing common terms and locations and places. Uh, so we're going to be working with our seventh grade world geography teachers to see when you get them in seventh grade, what do you need them to know and then work backwards from that point. Uh, the integration of civics is another really important thing. I mean, a lot of the meetings that I've been in with the uh, Department of Education, they've said civics is the biggest change that's going to come with history. We really want to emphasize civics and the integration of civics throughout all disciplines. Uh, so we're continuing to look at the different ways that we can integrate civics within the curriculums, regardless of the content. And then in fifth grade, we're going to start our curriculum revision this upcoming summer, um, where we're going to focus more on depth versus breadth. Um, rather than try to do, cover a very large historical time period, we're going to really focus in on the American Revolution and the U.S. Constitution to really get at that idea of civics so that when students are done in fifth grade, they have a very, very solid understanding of how our government works and ways that they can participate in their government. Uh, getting to Odyssey this past year, the sixth grade did a very, very exciting curriculum rewrite of ancient civilizations curriculum. We moved from a chronological approach to a thematic approach, and I'm going to let them talk about all that in a moment. Um, in seventh grade, we had new textbooks this year, and we were using now in the seventh grade a digital textbook, which is really exciting. Um, and it's been very, very successful this year. Having um, these up-to-date books and resources has been very beneficial for the teachers and the students. Um, and in eighth grade, um, along with this idea of thinking about difference and how we get along with each other, uh, we've been integrating some of my previous life at Facing History um, by this uh, wonderful case study they have about the French headscarf debate in France to help students understand what religious pluralism look like, looks like. Um, and oftentimes it's easy for students or it's easier for students to think about these issues in another country's context and then bring it back to where they live and think about their own lives. So that's the goal. Uh, with this student as well. Um, moving forward for Audison, the sixth grade, they're going to continue to fine tune the curriculum. Again, this summer, there's a lot of time allotted for them to re examine what worked and what didn't work. I think they've learned different things every day about the curriculum, and so have I. Um, in seventh grade, we're looking at ways to incorporate more writing into world geography curriculum and technology. Um, Julie Keyes, who's here also from the history department, uh, experimented this year with Google Expeditions. Um, so we want to integrate that into all the grades, but seventh grade world geography fits really well. So um, Google Expeditions is nice because it's a virtual reality experience where students can have their iPads or their phones and they can be wandering through the streets of Italy. They can be, you know, at Normandy Beach on D-Day, you know, coming out for one of the boats onto the beach. Um, so it's a, I think it's going to change the way that we teach history and we're excited about that as well. 
Um, in eighth grade, we're going to continue to incorporate more civics. Um, and we've had a wonderful experience with the medieval building project. And we're going to continue to look at that and think about new ways to approach that. Um, students love that project. They talk about it until they get to high school. Uh, but we also know that our students are changing. Technology is more pervasive. Um, so we want to see, are there different ways for students to show their understanding of their knowledge of medieval, medieval buildings and structures um, that type of way. Then finally getting to the high school. Uh, one of the things that we did last year is we had common final exams. So every 9th, 10th, and 11th grader took the same exam. Because of that, uh, I sound like Matt Coleman here. Uh, we were able to get some rich data from it <laughs> that we analyzed and I put into spreadsheets and it was very exciting. Um, and then just recently we were doing some grading calibration. Um, so we had essays from the final exams as we're looking towards rewriting them for this year. And we just sat together grading and um, talking about the ways that we were grading. So it was nice to get us all on the same page there. Um, inspired by our sixth grade teachers, our ninth grade is now looking at a curriculum revision. Uh, as you might know, the ninth grade curriculum is modern world history. Um, in learning about the curriculum last year, I realized that it was not modern, nor was it representative of the world. Because um, we were ending around World War II, and it was very heavily focused on European history. Um, this is the one chance I think students have to get into you know, the history of the Middle East, get into interesting topics like apartheid, understand revolution in Latin America. So we want to make sure that the curriculum reflects um, a knowledge of those things. Um, so they're looking at right now, we're just at the beginning processes of making that a thematic curriculum rather than a chronological curriculum. Um, in 10th and 11th grade, which are US history courses, their PLC work this year and the work that they've done has been on integrating diverse narratives into the curriculum. Um, so we've been looking at ways in US 1, for example, where we want to look at African Americans, not just through the lens of slavery or as victims, but talk about the cultural achievements, um, talk about the rich culture that some of them developed while they were on plantations, um, talking about Native American history. And we've had some really cool connections in US 1 this year by thinking about the pipeline that's brought Native American affairs to current events for students. Um, and next year at the high school, we'll be offering two new electives, history of Massachusetts and the history of the modern Middle East. So we're always excited to continue to expand our electives <coughs> offerings for our students. Um, next up at, uh, well, here you can see some highlights from the past year at the high school from the Ted Kennedy Institute. Uh, the technology has been great this year. We've done a lot of Skyping. So we've had scholars, I know Kristen had a scholar on Egypt Skype in with her class. Um, we've had um, various people, New York Times editors, New York Times writers. Um, we had, I'm blanking on his name because I'm in front of a microphone right now, um, but he was the chief translator for Nixon on his trip to China, and he Skyped in with our uh, seniors and juniors. So. Even though we can't bring all these people into our classrooms, we're still having really meaningful exchanges with scholars and academics, which is great. HS, moving forward, we're going to continue with our ninth grade curriculum work. Uh, we're going to continue to evaluate the 10th and 11th grade curriculum, knowing that the Department of Ed is aiming for around 2019 to update the Massachusetts social studies frameworks. Uh, so I'm trying to stay ahead of that as much as possible, um, because who knows, what, who knows what's going to be on the table with that. Um, we're always looking to see whether or not we should be expanding our AP program. So two APs that we're currently reviewing are AP Human Geography and AP World History. Um, we are looking at a potential partnership with Middlesex Community College to be able to offer um, three MCC credits, college credits to students for completing economics classes, American law classes, and psychology classes. Um, and as my wonderful English colleague said, this idea of research, research skills, source reliability, corroborating sources, um, has been something that's been really, really important to us that we're continuing to think about as a department, think about just as adults when we're having our conversations and how we get students to try to understand that. Um, so that picture there is from one of our New York Times Upfront magazine that students get um, talking about fake news and some of the activities that students did around that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to two representatives from our awesome sixth grade team, um, Kristen and Tom, and they're going to go for it. <laughs> OK. Um, so last year, we got really lucky. Um, Denny came in, and he gave us uh, the gift of reflective practice, which we're often given and asked to do um, in our own personal practice. But it's rare that, as a collective sixth grade, you are kind of given the ability to reflect as an entire grade as teachers and, and look deeply at the curriculum and how it could be improved and how its effectiveness is translating into the classroom. Um, and when we did this, we decided that there was 
a whole bunch missing. There were gaps between major connections that were being made. I know, at least in my classroom, a ton of the students would think that when we stopped the Egypt unit means that ancient Egypt stopped <laughs> and then we moved on to the next civilization. So they were really missing a lot of the rich and deep connections that you can make in the ancient world, um, especially with the interconnectedness and the way that they're um, constantly influencing each other. Um, so we kind of started from square one and said if we were to build a curriculum around ancient civilizations um, and pair it with the skills that we really want our kids to leave the classroom with and go on into their academic careers, um, what, what should we look for? What do we want? Um, so one was definitely what skills do we think they need not only in history but in cross-curricular because a lot of what the English department was talking about we also strive to do with uh, the claim and evidence-based writing just um, to name one example. Um, and then we also wanted to think about um, the whole civics. How are our lessons meaningful to the students? How do they connect to their lives and what's going on in the world today? Um, Next, we thought about this great gift that was given to us in technology. We have the iPads at our fingertips, and that really allows the students to do more inquiry and project-based learning. Um, and we find that with that and with the use of that technology and all the information at their fingertips, they're really able to produce substantial work with deeper connections um, and connections not only between civilizations, but in the modern world and in their own lives. So we've had some really great um, production as far as that goes. Um, it also allows us to teach with a little bit more flexibility as far as the civilizations go, so we're able to kind of throw in a couple more civilizations that we weren't looking at before, like the Indus River Valley, um, the Persian Empire, Kush Mesoamerica, um, and we don't necessarily use these with every project and, and everything that we do, um, but there are a lot of students I know that sometimes felt misrepresented. We have a lot of students from India, and they often would ask or their parents would, why don't we learn about India and ancient civilizations? So it really gives them more ownership over the curriculum and a lot of times they get to choose certain civilizations um, as an independent project or as a connection that they want to learn about. Um, so that's a really great addition. Uh, we also really wanted to make sure that students were able to compare, evaluate, and examine history rather than just memorizing it. Mm -hmm. In my classroom, I got rid of tests all together and we've really been doing inquiry and project-based learning and activity hands-on things where they're able to own the material and not just kind of regurgitate it which I say often in the classroom and they laugh at me but that's that's really what happens a lot of the times on testing and then the information's gone and it's not a skill and a fundamental um, thing that they've learned and they can take with them in their educational careers it's it's then gone to make space for the next thing to memorize um, so we found great luck in that and we think that they own the material a lot more based on that approach. Um, and it also allows us to accommodate various styles of learning, um, not just to our special education children, which it definitely does, but also to our more gifted students who are often looking for a bit more of a challenge, especially with integrating the technology into that. We have a lot more freedom to allow them to stretch and challenge themselves um, as often and as frequently as they can. Nice. Um, so up here on the board you can see uh, this is the current AP world history themes uh, and I'm not going to read them out to you but you can see that this is what we used as our inspiration when we were uh, looking for something to model our curriculum after. So we added one right before theme one. We just wanted to get that foundation skills um, how do you study history? What is an artifact? What's a primary source? What's a secondary source? Um, but then we moved on to trying to model after this list because to master these uh, to master these themes, you really need a lot more higher order thinking skills, a lot more critical thinking skills that we were really hoping to to push them towards, as opposed to rote memorization of names and dates uh, and the like. So. Yeah, great. And we also, Denny was talking um, about vertical alignment, and we were thinking about that too when we were looking at the curriculum. What are they doing at the high school, and what are skills that we can start working on in the middle school that they can then utilize and have a foundation for when they get there? Um, so theme one, thinking like a historian, this is, we spend a lot of time in the beginning thinking about kind of cross-curricular cross questioning. So in history, in science, in a lot of different areas, um, 
we kind of study based on questions that we come up with. And so learning how to question um, is really important. So that's where we start. And with that, we also talk about um, archaeology and look at specific applications of that questioning, not only within archaeology, but within um, prehistory and specific artifacts within prehistory that we can then start that inquiry-based uh, research and development. Um, our next theme is interactions between human and the environment. And what we really wanted to do here is this would have been geography, but we wanted to do more than what we typically did with geography because there's so much more you can do. So not only do we focus on geography um, of a civilization, but we focus on how that geography, how those physical features impact the people that live there, and then how do those people in turn impact their environment and their geography, which really lends itself to thinking about, okay, now thinking in modern terms, especially with um, modern technology, how has that then changed how humans impact their environment and how environment impacts humans. So we do like a really great environmental study um, for the kids and they kind of can see what's going on now that we have all this new technology and how does that change the way we impact um, our environment. Um, theme three is the development of culture, which we've been spending a lot of time, and we've been noticing there's so many ways to investigate culture. Um, so right now, for example, the students are um, doing a passport to the ancient world, um, and they're actually flying to the different civilizations, and they're experiencing it, not only just answering questions, but if you're putting yourself in the shoes of the ancient people, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? What are you tasting? So it's those higher order thinking skills that's making them apply what they learn to actually kind of have a simulation of an experience of what it would be like to, in fact, live there during that time. Um, so this is about where we are at the moment. We're wrapping up the culture unit. And part of the beauty of this pilot year is that we have the flexibility to try different things in our classrooms and then sort of regroup at the end of the year and see what worked and see what didn't work. Um, so while some classes are doing that passport to the ancient world, uh, others might be doing a research project or, or some kind of comparative activity where you examine cultures of your chosen civilizations uh, and make connections that way. But next up, we have power expansion and conflict, which is where we'll look at things like government, uh, nations coming into conflict, related to today's world as often as possible. Uh, we'll do inventions after that, and then we'll finish it off with trade networks, just to, again, try to build up as much connectivity as we can and really give them a, a global, this is all happening at the same time feel. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where yeah. we're heading. Yeah, and I think what's really great about this and with the themes is um, Eli was talking about patterns. And so in, in teaching in a theme with something like power expansion and conflict, they're able to see all of this unfolding together. They're able to see the patterns, how one is affecting the other and how things are actually playing out, seeing different perspectives versus just seeing a one-sidedness of these are the causes of the Persian War from this perspective. So they're getting more of a global approach all the time as we're looking at it and being able to make more deep and meaningful connections. Um, so we're really excited about the end of the year assessment that we can came up with this year, um, mostly because just as ELA was talking about, a lot of times the students are able to engage more and give um, a better final product when they're able to choose how they show what they learn. And that's something that I've been doing in my classroom um, since I've been here and I, I really enjoy how much better the final product comes out when the kids are more engaged in it, when they are more invested in it, because they're taking ownership of it, because they are able to choose how they're going to show you what they know. So we've decided every theme, they're collecting a piece from this theme. And so we've started kind of these portfolios for them, some of us digitally, some, some in paper, some um, kind of mentally. But they're taking an element from each theme, and they're taking ownership of it. And at the end of the year, they're going to create their own civilization based on pieces and connections that they've made over the course of the year. So it's kind of um, a, a worldly perspective of what they've learned, just trying to add on the comparisons and the deeper comparisons that we want them to make all year long. Um, so for my uh, class so far, they um, created a physical features ad based on the ad that they think would most benefit civilizations to live near. And that is one of the physical features they have to include in their civilization at the end of the year. They created a super god 
God that is composed of all different elements of gods of all different cultures of the ancient world. And that is a god that they will have to include in their civilization at the end of the year. So not only do we want them to examine closely and apply um, their knowledge and their connections while they're in these themes, but we also want them to be able to carry that on and to be able to show what they've learned throughout the year. Um, in Minecraft or in a poster or in a model and something that they will be able to apply all that knowledge um, and be really proud of and be able to kind of take that with them and use that understanding of what they've learned and the connections um, in the different groups of settlements of people in the world um, and carry that on into their other history classrooms. Great, thank you very much. Um, questions, comments? Yes, Mr. Hainer. I have a question and a comment. Uh, you do enjoy what you're doing, don't you? <laughs> yes, Absolutely, I, yeah. we do. <laughs> and I gotta say, I think that's the best part of teaching, to get paid to do something you really enjoy. Yeah. Thank you very much for everything, it's exciting. You know, every time I hear this, I'm like, oh, I wish I could go back to sixth grade, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, this sounds really cool. Yeah, it's, it's yes. great. Well, yeah. we're, we're really lucky. I mean, we wouldn't have been given this opportunity if it wasn't for Denny, so Absolutely. we're very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. I noticed uh, at the beginning of your uh, presentation, you have a APS history department uh, Twitter account, which I just hit, and it seems you're doing selfie station exit tickets in yes. the sixth grade? Yes. So Allison has a Twitter account. I have a Twitter account, but I only created it when Zahi Huas, the former Secretary of Antiquities for Egypt, Skyped with my class because uh -huh. I saw he had one. So I tweeted it and he retweeted it and then I, I just quit Twitter right then because <laughs> I thought it's never gonna top this. <laughs> but um, yes, Allison tweets out, so we're doing the Passport to the Ancient World right now. And after they visit, their homework assignment for this whole week is they're tweeting out um, their experience and the, the civilization that they're in. So they're not actually doing it on Twitter, they're doing it on Google classroom, but we created a forum for them to be able to do that. So they're having a lot of fun with that. I thought it was quite impressive that we had a student, uh, two students on the Great Wall of yes. China. Yes. <laughs> there is an amazing green screen app that is only $2.99 that comes in very handy. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's, it's, it's fortunate it's a low budget item. We have somebody on the shoulder of a stack. <laughs> this is great stuff. I, yeah, this has got to be fun. Yeah. It's very fun. The kids like it. <laughs> Mr. Carton. Uh, okay, thanks. I, I wasn't here last year, so I, I did see your presentation, Denny, but I was going to ask questions. So, um, not specifically on the sixth grade, but um, I, I drove this on this in the seventh grade and a daughter in the fifth grade, and um, they're still being required to learn, this is my pet peeve, state capitals and country capitals. And that seems way out of line with, uh, with all of what you're doing in the, in the sixth grade. Do you see it moving forward, moving away from that kind of stuff, or is that still? I certainly can understand them needing to know where countries are, but memorizing a list of state capitals and country capitals just seems so old school. Um, I completely agree with you. That type of memorization, some of it is very, very beneficial for students, as you noted. Um, but I also didn't want to come in and uproot everybody in <laughs> my first, yeah. first and second year. So a lot of it is, you know, I'm having conversations with teachers. I'm asking them questions, um, you know, even at the high school where some teachers are having students take notes on the textbook for homework. I'm saying, is this a meaningful assignment? Uh, similar to what uh, De Perry was saying, I asked one of my teachers a question. I said, you know, if it's this easy to cheat and to copy an assignment, does that mean it's meaningful? Yeah. Uh, because now you can go online, find any textbook, and find somebody who's taking notes on that textbook and just copy and paste that. It's, it's crazy. So that we've been thinking about this idea of meaningful. We've been thinking about this idea of um, the application of skills and what that means. Uh, so it's a direction that I hope social studies goes on throughout the district, and we're chipping away at it little by little. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.